Eric Bischoff, how you doing? I'm doing great. Well, you picked the you picked the perfect day to come on. You're the talk of the sh- the talk of wrestling. Uh, well, <laughs> hopefully, I, mean, I haven't been near a computer obviously uh, since yesterday. So hopefully, it's, hopefully it's positive. It's been real positive. It's you know it's the best night for show in a long, long time. Uh, well, that's not saying much. <laughs> <laughs> It's the nicest thing I'm going to say. <laughs> it's true. That's kind of like a cool way of saying, well, you really didn't suck last night. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you have a sense of humor about the product the last three months. You know? Well, you know what? In, in its fairness, it's not just been the last three months. You know, um, I've been gone for seven months, and we weren't exactly, you know, blowing the roof off the building before I left either. So, you know, WCW has been in a kind of a soft state, in my opinion, for about a year year and a half uh, it's been since I've felt personally that we've been competitive and that we've had a tight product so it's it's not just been the last three months I think the last three months were as horrible as it's ever been but it didn't start three months ago yeah now now I want to ask you what do you attribute the fall of WCW going back a year year and a half when it started to go down to and also what have you learned by not being there week after week and not having that pressure to put on a show every Monday and you can kind of sit back and look at it from a different perspective well, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of things. I'm going to try not to repeat some of the answers that I've given out in the multitudes of interviews that I've done over the last week. But you know, there isn't just one thing that went wrong, unfortunately, because that would be real easy to fix uh, and to focus on. There's a lot of things. You know, com- complacency certainly factors in. You know, a year and a half ago, two years ago, we were rolling, we were on top, and we found a formula that worked very well for us. We didn't think about changing that formula. Uh, fans got tired of that formula, and we tried different variations of it, you know, to kind of keep the interest, but quite frankly, it just didn't work. One of the other things that really changed the audience's taste, quite frankly, is, you know, the, the, the direction that the WWF went in. You know, during that period of time when we were really dominating them for as long as we were, and the gap was getting wider and wider, and the pressure was really on, they made a, a drastic strategic change in the way they produced their program. Uh, you know, including the, you know the TNA and the language and the, you know, the, the hand gestures and all of that. You know, created a real, real edgy, dangerous kind of show. Dangerous in terms of you know watching it. We couldn't follow that. You know, we knew we couldn't follow that. I knew we couldn't follow that. And not only had we grown complacent, quite frankly, uh, from a creative point of view, but in order to compete with them, you know, we would have had to go a step further in that direction that they were than they were going to really be competitive. And that looked just like a Me Too kind of an effort. Um, and we couldn't do that. We were stuck in a, in a creative box, quite frankly, because of who we are, meaning, you know, Turner Time Warner, um, that was very difficult to get out of. You know, and there was a lot of other things, you know. We didn't use our young talent the way we should have used our young talent. Um, we didn't create interest in our stories the way we should have. And there's a lot of things that went wrong. And as far as you know, what I've learned, you know, I've just learned to focus on those things, you know, just sit back, look at it as objectively as you can humanly be. And, you know, I am, I'm trying to be objective. Um, there's still a big part of me that's, you know, wrapped around this thing and, you know, some of the, the, the right things that we did. But, uh, yeah, I'm also trying to step back and look at some of the wrong decisions we've made and fix them. How, how did everything go down yesterday with uh, with Mike Awesome and, and over like whatever it was the last week or you know you know what, what what did it take to bring him in and and how did everything get settled with ECW? Um, I, actually, it, it's not settled, and because it's not settled, um, I can't talk about it. And it's not that I don't want to, but I literally uh, the reason I was ten minutes late calling into you is I was on the phone with our attorneys, and uh, I, I can't. I can't discuss. Okay, so, so is he like? I mean, can I? Is he with you, or is it? Is, is everything still up in the air then? It's uh, still a jump ball. Oh wow. Okay. Now, what um, do you have any uh, as far as like uh, any matches as far as a card aside from the main event for Chicago on Sunday? Um, basically, it, yeah, they're all going to be title matches. Uh, we haven't named any matches yet, and we're not going to do that until tonight. It'll okay. it'll become more clear tonight. I don't want to scoop my own show. Okay. Any any interest as far as bringing in? Uh, some some free agents as far as uh, Sabu is a name that's pop, popped around the last couple of days. Yeah, um, you know I like Sabu. You know personally, I, you know I I, I, got, I guess I got along with him. I never really had you know that much to do with him. Uh, but the short period of time he was here, you know I enjoyed having him here, uh, and he was a professional. 
Um, I like what he does in the ring. You know, when I heard that he was coming to WCW, before I really knew I was coming back to WCW, um, my only question was, you know, he's got a guy that's got a very unique style, and it takes, you know, two people to dance. I'm not sure that there's anybody here that can dance with the guy, you know, on an ongoing basis. You can get a couple special matches out of him here or there, or here and there, but, you know, we don't have, you know, the kind of talent that we need to have the kind of matches that really make him look good. Uh, on our roster, um, but we're, you know we're talking about it, and I'm sure there's interest there. I'm not sure if it'll ever happen, but we'll certainly look at it. As far as other free agents, there's just not that many out there, quite frankly. You know, the WWF has got their guys wrapped up pretty well. We've got our guys wrapped up pretty well. You know, as far as everybody else goes, I don't want to speak to that, but apparently they may or may not be wrapped up depending on who you talk to. Yeah. Now, um, the old guy for Sabu maybe is a uh, crowbar as far as... Uh... Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are one or two guys here, but if you're going to bring someone in, particularly you know, a guy like Sabu who's going to want some bucks, you know, you got to have you, know, you got to have a lot of guys here for him. You know, you have a pool of talent that they can work with so they can work against each other and you, you can develop storylines and angles that are going to last six months or a year or whatever. you got to have guys in case crowbar gets injured you can still have a match with. And I just don't think we have enough guys that will really compliment Sabu the way he needs to be complimented. What's exactly uh, your your title and uh, and your duties right now? Uh, Wrestling God uh, is the title that I'm that I'm answering to today. Wrestling Dog perhaps tomorrow, but you never know. Um, the, the duties really vary, you know, uh, from day to day. Vince Russo is really running things uh, as far as the television show is concerned. I work with Vince. Uh, I don't know, long-term planning, strategic issues, you know, that, that, that involve creative uh, talent issues that involve, you know, long-term storylines and things like that. But basically, you know, Vince and I are working together on the show to kind of set the tone of the show and, and book long-term plans on a day-to-day basis. You know, for example, today I'm probably handling more things that has to do with the Mike Awesome situation than I normally would, but uh, the duties really vary depending on the situation. And I don't have a title, uh, all, all kidding aside. Uh, when I came back to WCW, I made it clear that, uh, in fact, when they called and said, well, what would it take to get you back? You know, I said, well, I don't want to come back unless, um, you know, the situation has changed dramatically. And unless my situation, my relationship with the company can change dramatically. Because there's just a lot of things that I didn't want to get involved with again. And I, you know, uh, when Brad and I talked about it, we discussed the areas that I think that I can contribute the most to. One of those areas being creative. You know, one of the areas that they were most interested in at the time, you know, was the talent end of it. And the third area that I think I can really be the biggest benefit is in, you know, the strategic growth of the brand. You know, opportunities like Ready to Rumble and, and other projects that, uh, that we have in development that will not only grow the WCW brand, you know, as far as a wrestling company, but it'll, it'll grow us, you know, in an entertainment field as well. Is there anything that you're doing? Because I think one of the things about the WCW in the last, you know, I mean, I mean really, I think this has probably gone back three, four years um, in, in a form, which is a storyline form, but certainly in the last year and a half, especially with teenagers um, and, and even young adults, WCW has represented sort of a uncool, unhip, uh, failing wrestling company to a lot of people. Um, you, know, it, it, you know, is there anything that you're, trying to do, you know, what, you know, from a, I guess an outsider perspective to, I mean, obviously I think that's probably your number one challenge is, is that image of WCW right now. Well, a part of that, you know, a part of that image goes back to what we talked about earlier. You know, when, when the WWF launched, you know, the kind of strategic uh, campaign that they did, you know, two years ago, that certainly was edgy. And by virtue of the fact that it was, uh, you know, I don't know how to really characterize it, but it was, you know, let's call it R-rated television at the time. Um, that, that was cool, you know to a large part of the audience that watches wrestling, that was really taking it to the next level. Um, we're not able to do that, so by virtue of that fact, you know, we were perceived to be uncool. Um, that was one of the reasons, you know, we were perceived to be uncool. But, you know, one thing I really want to point out, you know, when again, when we were winning and we were on top and we were you know, really growing Nitro and growing the brand, you know, we were the coolest thing going because of the way that we went about doing it. We changed wrestling in 95 and 96, 97, early 98, and we were the ones that had the edge. WWF countered in a way that we couldn't counter counteract, really. Um, and now the challenge before us, and you're right about this, Dave, the challenge before us now is how do we get cool? How do we get that edge? How do we make this brand attractive to an, a, an, a, a, a demo that is basically 18 to 39-year-old men? How do we get attractive to them uh, without doing you know, the same thing that the WWF did? I think last night's show is an example of what we're going to try to do. Um, 
I think that should speak for itself, and, and we're going to try to do more of that. You know, the wrestling audience, as you know, Dave, you know, they want to be surprised. They want to be challenged. They want you to do things that they didn't predict uh, or couldn't predict. You know, they love to be swerved, and that's one of the first things we're going to try to really focus on because those are things that we can do. Now, um, last night there was a lot of what I would call insider comments, and you could see in the building in Denver – you know, like a, a, I, I tell you, I tell you what the thing that I would say would be negative on the show as a fan was I'm I'm watching announcers. You know, Scott Hudson, who you know I you know, I think does a great job, but I mean he, he's trying to oversell something that the live crowd doesn't understand. It's like when he's going, oh my god, oh my god, and the live crowd is sitting there for like an insider comment. I think that it's almost like you know the people at home are going like. He's overselling something that doesn't exist because I think a lot, you know, a lot, I think the, the majority of the audience, when if the if the fans live aren't really understanding, I think the majority of the audience at home isn't, and unless it's the announcers are given the uh, what's the, the leeway to explain when it's clear the audience isn't understanding a comment, yeah. or the or the person who's delivering the comment, you know, even even like your comment with the scissors with Sid Vicious, yeah. you know, it's sort of like it was real obvious that like you know you know most people don't know that story. It's a great story for people who do know, right. and, you know what I mean. So it's got to be. I think some of the stuff needs to be better explained, or it's just going. Or people are just going like, "What is going on in these storylines?" No, you know, you're you're right about that, and um, it, it's a little frustrating for me. And, 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 and but I understand why they're doing what they're doing, and, and really, it's up to us to kind of you know corral everybody and say, "Okay, look, here's here's what we want to do. Here's what we don't want to do." I don't agree with the use of insider comments. I really don't, for the very reasons that you pointed out. Um, Unfortunately, though, especially with young announcers, and you know, Scott's a relatively new announcer. He, he's, he's very new at this, and so is Mark Madden, for that matter. Um, and a guy like Shivani, who has, you know, obviously you know, a lot of experience, is trying to be cool in his own way. He's, he's trying to be relevant uh, to the audience, and we all forget because we're also everybody's adjusting to the to the whole internet. You know, phenomenon, and I mean, not just in wrestling. Our entire culture is adjusting to the internet phenomenon because it's, it's virtually affecting almost every aspect of our lives, uh, particularly in the entertainment business. And everybody's adjusting to it. But I think one of the ways that we've overcorrected, if you will, or, or tried to over or overreach our embrace of the internet audience is by you know, using a lot of inside information. It's true. Guys like Dave Meltzer do it and Wade Keller and, you know, whoever else has got, you know, their own internet, internet sites or their own news webs. Certainly you guys do it. And our guys are affected by that. And sometimes to, to, to kind of be relevant to that audience, they go too far. And we got to remember who our audience is. Our audience, generally speaking, are people that have never been near an internet wrestling site or been near a, a a newsletter, if you was going to call it dirt cheap, but out of respect for you, Dave, I won't call it dirt okay. cheap. Okay. What, what's as far as the TV situation? I've got I've got a couple of emails from Canada, and I'm just how it regards. Do you have any idea of where the WWF is going to wind up in September? If it's going to be on a CBS cable and off of USA, and how that would affect the landscape? And also, if if that were to happen, and they would be off TSN, would you be able to move to the Monday night slot on TSN and, and be, you know, more up to date in Canada? Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I, I haven't really stayed abreast of that, uh, the CBS Viacom deal uh, as it relates to WWF. I, I really don't know. And quite frankly, I haven't given much thought to it. Um, there's been too many other things that have been more pressing right now. In terms of what, you know, a move like that, how that would affect the overall landscape, you know, generally speaking, I think it's a good thing. You know, anytime there's growth in the industry, and I don't care if it's a WWF's growth or WCW's or ECW's or anybody else's, you know, for the business to to sustain itself long term, we all have to grow. Uh, so I, I think it's a great thing. You know, when I read it, you know, was I jealous? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to be sitting down with, you know, CBS or any other network and, and you know having a broadcast partner. But um, the fact that it's not me is not that big a deal. I, th I just think it's important for the business, and I'm, I'm glad it's happening. Now, um, uh, as I say about uh, – what do I have right here? Um, as far as um, the injury situation in the company, um, the company kind of has a thing. What's your thoughts as far as cutting guys' pay when they're injured, unable to perform? Uh, do you think that – it encourages some guys to come back too early, which may encourage drug use, or do you think it's something that necessarily needs to be done 
just because of the nature of of the wrestling business. You know, I mean, well, I mean yeah, <laughs> kind of reaching a little bit there as far as cut, whether a guy's injury you know, cutting his pay is going to force him to use drugs or not. That that's a stretch. It, 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 it could. <laughs> it could, I guess, but you know, there's a lot of other factors that are going to occur to that before you know an injury will. If a guy's going to do it, he's going to do it. Period. Um, look, you, you know, the WWF business model and the WCW business model are two entirely different models. And by the way, I didn't create this. I wasn't the first one in WCW to offer a guaranteed contract. It's kind of an environment and a model that I inherited. Certainly, I expanded upon it and took it to a whole new level. But, you know, guaranteed contracts were the way business was being done in WCW long before Eric Bischoff arrived. Now, that being, that being said, you know, the WWF's talent business model, if you will, is such that if you work and you perform and you're on the road and you're at house shows and you're on pay-per-views and do TVs, you make a lot of money. If you don't, because you're injured or otherwise, you don't make that much money. You know, they offer a downside guarantee, which is basically, you know, who knows, anywhere from half to a third of what guys who are working all the time make. You see what I'm saying? So if you're healthy, you're working, yeah, you get a downside guarantee plus all these other benefits that you get by being on the road and being in house shows. What we've done is say, look, we don't our business model isn't built that way. You know, we don't we don't pay you based on the number of performances. You don't get a share of the house or a share of a pay per view. That's just not how we operate. But at the same time, we've got to protect ourselves too. So that if a guy does get injured, we're not paying top dollar. Just like Vince McMahon doesn't pay, you know, his guys uh, a share of a house show that they're not on. It's basically the same thing. We've just adjusted it to, to the way WCW does business. You have to do that. You can't, you know, we can't be in this business, particularly with the number of guys that we have and, and the levels that we're paying them. You can't afford to keep them, you know, at full pay when they're not working. It's just not, you know, no other business does. Is there, um, any things that you're seeing as far as from the outside, as far as like, uh, that you might want to, whether it be unprotected chair shots to the head or something that's kind of a dangerous trend that you may want to... I mean, like, obviously, this is an audience that wants thrills. And, it, it, you know, it's, it's this double-edged sword. They want thrills. They want more and more thrills, you know, like the, the evil Knievel. But then the other end of that is that the more you do that, the more guys you're going to have on the injury list. And is there kind of like a balance of, of where you want to stop? Or do you think it's gone too far? Um, no, that's a good point. It's, it's a great observation. And to a degree, I think it has gone too far. And, you know, it's not the first time I've ever felt that way. When when Mick Foley was working for WCW, I remember we were at an event in uh, Philadelphia, and he wanted to come off a balcony onto the floor. And I said, Mick, I can't let you do that. You know, I mean, he really wanted to do that because he knew it would get him over. Yeah, it would have gotten him over, and it would have gotten WCW over. But there's a point where you're going to say, no, I mean, yeah, okay, it's great for tonight, but, you know, you're going to be able to make a house show tomorrow night. You know, are you going to be able to get up and go play with your kids next week? You know, there's a point where it, it's, it is too far. And putting, you know, Mick aside, because he's a very special guy, you know, with how he's been able to do it all these years, I, I just do not know. But, you know, your average wrestler is not going to be able to do those kinds of things over and over and over. He's not going to be able to replicate them every night in house shows or every week in house shows and on other television shows and pay-per-views uh, without getting hurt and then, you know, being off the roster or, or worse, for that matter. So the challenge, I think, is for guys to find ways to get over without having to potentially injure themselves to the extent that they do. Now, uh, we, should, we should give the phones real quick. Um, and everyone, we've got a full bank of calls, so we want to go through these as quickly, as quickly as we can. I'll start with Pete in Toronto. You're up with Eric. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Man? Okay. Um, I, I didn't really hear the answer there. Uh, do you have any plans on getting uh, the Nitro show shown live on Monday or moved to a different time slot because we don't get it here on TSN until like midnight on Wednesday or 3.30 a.m. Yeah. Uh, my answer, quite quite honestly, was I haven't really had uh, time to address that. Oh, okay. uh, I mean, it's certainly on the list of things that need to get done and need to get fixed, and, and if there's an opportunity there, we certainly want to take advantage of it. But I've only been back really, you know, for really about a week and a half, and it's just not something that I've dealt with yet. All right, that's, that's all. Thanks a lot. You bet. Okay, very, you're very welcome. You know, speaking of the time slots, I know that, uh, you know, you've made some comments about this, uh, elsewhere. Um, is there, are you going to make a strong push to move, uh, Nitro back an hour on Monday night so you go head to head for two hours or move Thunder to Thursday? 
Uh, definitely, I want to go head to head on Monday. I mean, I, I think that's you know that's high on my list of priorities uh, to go head to head. For for all the reasons you probably you know read about, and I'll, I'll repeat it you know one more time. You know, if we want to be competitive, if we want to win the fight, we've got to get in the fight. And I don't think staggering our start times is a competitive move. I think that's a um, that's an evasive maneuver, not an aggressive maneuver, and we need to be aggressive right now. So you don't want to go to three hours again, do you? I would rather you... chew off my leg yeah. you know, than go three hours. Uh, I didn't want to do it the first time, and I certainly won't go back to it now. Uh, let's go to Western Virginia, Wes. You're up with Eric. Hi, guys. Uh, Eric, one of the things I thought that was great about WCW in, like, 95 and 96 was the cruiserweight division and the excellent work rate from the guys. Do you plan on... Uh, doing anything to rebuild that uh, to help, you know, bring in fans? Absolutely. You know, and I know this will sound like I'm, I'm you know, blowing my own heart here, and, and to a degree I am, uh, and I want to, but that's not really why I'm, I'm, I'm saying this. You know, we were the first ones, I think, at, at, at a national level to really emphasize the cruiserweight division. And we did it, and, you know, I'll never forget when I brought uh, Chris and Dean and Eddie into the office and told them what, what I wanted to do. I said, guys, you know the matches that you're, you're capable of having are, you know, they're, they're human car crashes. That's what they are. I mean, they're fast-paced, they're explosive, uh, they're exciting to watch, and I think that's an important part of what WCW needs to do. I believed it then, and I believe it now. Uh, so to answer your question, absolutely, we want to uh, really put a lot more emphasis on that cruiserweight division because it's entertaining as hell. Well, thanks for the comments, Eric. You got okay, thanks very much, Wes. Let's go to David in New York. David, you're next up with Eric. Hey, uh, my question for Eric is, why do you call Bruce Mitchell a pedophile on Left Line? I never did. You compared him to uh, M.L. Curley. I compared Bruce Mitchell's approach to reporting uh, to uh, Bruce, uh, excuse me, to uh, Jim Thompson. But you said he went to the Jim Thompson School of Reporting, which is like saying how Grohl on Cooney's today, the Terry Garvin School of Self-Defense. No, it's not at all. You were in plot. You, no, but you said that they had similar hobbies and interests. Absolutely, I did. And they do. Similar hobbies was a little strong. I, I thought so. That might have been a little strong, but they do have similar hobbies. They both write about wrestling. No, you said more than they. You said they have more in common than people would think. They do have more in common than people think. Neither one of them step outside of their zip code to really report on wrestling. Neither one of them know half the time what the hell they're talking about when it comes to wrestling. But they'll they'll be the first ones to put themselves out as wrestling experts and tell the world what's wrong with it. That's what, that's what they have in common. And my other question is, since your ca your on air character last night was kind of gloating about ramming the Hummer into the limo, will the Hogan character be tra pressing charges? Gee, I don't know. Do you think he should? I'm just saying that, like, it's not like he was just suddenly. It's not. It's because the way it was done that you you know you come out bragging about it. You know, last time if it was like someone, you know. If it was just someone said it was, if it was who was driving the Hummer, but the person kept the person could have kept denying it or something, you know, like if Randy Savage said Eric Bischoff was driving the Hummer, then your character could have denied it, and you know it's not like there would have been anything you know like within the storyline that could have supposedly held up in court, but just the way it was done, like it's not like you just hit him, beat him up in the locker room, you hit the guy for the car. Yeah. My point is, is that it's not, it's, uh, the fact that the character gloats about it instead of, in, you know, instead of just feeding away. I mean, I kind of understand the way that it was done, you know, that if you just drove away without getting out of the car, then it would have been another three months of who's driving the Hummer. But it just seems too, I mean, you know, you know it just seems too unrealistic even for wrestling that someone could hit someone with a car and there will be no charges pressed. Um, I'm I'm not sure if you're uh, how old are you by the way? But, uh, um, why do I have to tell you that? Well, you don't have to tell me. I won't take you to court if you don't tell I'm me. I'm just saying that. <laughs> no, 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 no. Answer the question. How old are you? I'm a teenager. I'm 15. Okay, okay. Um, when you know when we produce a show, we're we're producing a show to create emotion. We're not producing a show to, uh, you know, create a format that would stand up under the scrutiny of a judge. There's a lot of things that we do that in, in real life would never be able to play out. 
There's a lot of things that the WWF does that in real life, if you put that, that real analytical, you know, magnifying glass over every single thing that you do, you wouldn't do anything. And the things that you would do would be pretty boring when, when, when you really get down to it. True, but wrestlers have been arrested on Nitro before, and it was for petty things like powerbombing people. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, look, you've got a point. You know, when, when we laid out the show, we, we lay out a show to create emotion, to create controversy. You know, I did what I did because I wanted people to hate my guts for doing it. And the fact that I gloated about doing it, I think, probably got the reaction that we wanted to get out of the audience. And that's why we did it. Now, is there a more logical approach? There probably is. Is there, is there an approach that would, um, you know, play out in court? There probably is. But, you know, that's not what we're doing here. We're creating emotion. We're creating entertainment. And sometimes we do it from, you know, a very logical point of view, and sometimes we do things that in real life would never happen. But that's why we're television, and that's why it's entertainment. You're the last person to talk about logic, though. I'm sorry? I mean, you're the kind of the last person to talk about logic, though, because you did push the giant off the roof. You had that angle. You're right. Sometimes we do things that are logical, and sometimes we we don't. I'm, I, hey, look, I'm not I'm not defending WCW as you know the the the, uh, the rock bed of wrestling logic. That's that's not the approach. One last thing. I hope so. One not last that I don't not that I don't mind talking to you, but <laughs> it's okay. One last thing. I mean. <laughs> You, there was a lot of criticism for your idea for that you, what, what you were going to have for Vamp, with Vampiro at the New Year's pay-per-view. Do you regret, do you regret suggesting that idea since some people say it led to your uh, demotion? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't even understand the question. Uh, you, remember the angle that you thought of with Vampiro jumping into the holy water? Uh, I, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. That, that wasn't ever planned? <laughs> I've never even heard of it before. Um, because I've heard of it from a lot of reliable sources. But it can't be too reliable. Uh, I guess so. But, uh, Dave, do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, I vaguely know that there was an angle with Vampiro and the demon that was... I never heard Holy Water exactly, but I just heard that there was a Vampiro demon That it was Vampiro was going to jump in... Into, that Vampiro was going like, to get thrown into Holy Water by the demon, and ICP was going to sacrifice themselves or something. I, I have never even heard of this before. Okay, that's a good thing, then. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, we've got to get running. We've got a full bank of calls, okay? Okay, let's go to Tim in Maine. Tim, you're next up. Hi, Eric. How's it going? Going great. Congratulations. I like the gray hair over the black. I got two quick things to say. I'm a longtime WCW fan, and I really, really didn't like last night. I don't know how you can say it's a new era when Hogan and Flair are the most pushed guys on the show. When Hogan says, what are you going to do, put Tino in that spot? Yes, it's exactly what needs to happen. And number two, the other thing that disturbed me, it was a show full of red flags. I'm talking about Scott Steiner, Scott Hall, Chris Candido, Sean Stajak, almost killing Kurt Hennig. These are not guys that belong in a locker room, and I wonder why are they there? Why are they employed? I mean, are you guys going to bring in, like, Buddy Landell and Jake Roberts next? Hello? Uh, I'm not sure what you're implying. Um, I mean, look at Scott Steiner. Yes. Yeah, look at Scott Steiner. I mean, did he get that body by lifting weights and eating Metrex bars? I mean, come on. He's got no promo. He can't work. And I mean, he's just a red flag. Uh, well, I disagree with you, and I think so do a lot of other people. All right, well, then what about Flair and Hogan? Why are they the most pushed guys when it's like a new era? I think it's did just, you, did you, it just you, it disappoints you, me that a guy really like Booker show, or, or are you pretending you were watching the show? Oh, I watched the whole thing. I watched we, the twice, we, actually. We used Hulk Hogan and Rick Flair to get other people over, which is how they should be being used right now. Yeah, but Taka Michinoku, like, Triple H sold so bad for Taka, Hogan didn't do a thing to get Kidman over, and all they kept talking about, what's Flair going to do, what's Hogan going to do? You know, why was Booker T only on for 30 seconds? Look, there were 80 guys in the locker room last night that all wanted to be on that show. There was no way we were going to have 80 people all on the show. <laughs> you know, we put, the show, we, we put a show together last night that we thought was you know, the best product that we could put out, you know, with the talent that we have and the situation we have. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of talent on tonight's show that wasn't on last night's show. There's going to be a lot of talent on next Monday's show that wasn't on or that, there's going to be a lot of talent on next Monday's show uh, that, you know, you, you didn't see last Monday. It, look, we're going to put the whole company out in one night. If that's your point, I'm not even sure I understand it. Well, it's just that I don't see any new error because all the same old guys are getting pushed again. And you, you keep talking about the mistakes I made absolutely before, disagree. and you're making them again. I disagree. Absolutely disagree. But DDP, Sting wrestling twice, Sid wrestling twice? You know, I mean, Sid on again? I mean, I don't know. Why, where was Booker T? Where was Vampiro? Where were all the young guys? 
Why is Scott Steiner a young guy? They were all there last night. We, we, last night was the beginning of a story. It wasn't the complete story. You're going to see those guys tonight. Watch the show tonight and ask yourself the same question. Ask yourself how we're using Booker T. Ask yourself how, how we're using Van Curl. And then get my home phone number from Dave and call me and tell me that we're not using him in the right way. I'll be interested to hear, I'll be interested to hear you say that. Are you serious? If Dave gives me your home phone number, you won't mind. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Tim Davis. I'm a Kenny Bunkman. I'll be more than happy to call you. I mean, the fans have said, we don't want Jeff Jarrett on top, and you guys put him on. I think WCW's biggest mistake is that you're not listening to the fans sometimes. Hey, listen, I want you to succeed, too. I'm right behind you, know you, Eric. You know what? I, I absolutely disagree with you, because I would say the overwhelming majority of the audience that we've heard from absolutely love the show. The fact that you didn't, or the fact that you look at it a different way, doesn't mean that you speak for all of the audience. But look at the buy rates when Jeff Jarrett was headlining. No, we're talking about two different things here. You're talking about two different things. You're telling me that you're absolutely convinced that we did the wrong thing last night because we don't listen to the fans. 100%. I'm telling you that you're wrong. But you're listening the to the majority of the fans that watched the show last night that enjoyed the show feel completely differently than you do. So you don't you don't speak for the entire audience either. I'm not saying I do. I'm just trying to say some of the things that disturb me. I never said I was. But look at the look at the buy race that Jared had when he was headlining. You know, look but at all the look at. I'm seeing a lot of mistakes that have been made over the past year, and I saw them last night. That's what I'm saying. You can't. You, you certainly can't put you know the failure that WCW was experiencing over the last three months on Jeff Jarrett. You can't look at the buy, buy rates uh, of the pay per views that he was on and say it's Jeff Jarrett's fault. The fact is, the whole promotion sucked for the last three months. The fact is, you could put anybody you wanted to in a main event uh, in WCW for the last three months, and nobody would draw. That's because the brand is down, not because of any one individual. If it was that easy, it would be easy to fix. It's not that easy. Okay. Tim, right. Tim, we've got, Tim, I we've got to move on. Now. I'm sorry. Thanks. Okay, you just got to, we've got to move on. Real quick, before we get to the next call, I want to ask you what the status of Scott Hall is, because we've had that question asked a lot today. Yeah, you know, I don't really know. I haven't talked to Scott. I haven't talked to anybody, that, you know, I haven't talked to any of his agents or attorneys or anything like that, anybody that represents him. The only thing I know is probably what you know is that he went in for neck surgery, and beyond that, I, I really don't know. Okay, let's go to Anthony in Los Angeles. Anthony, you're next up with Eric Bishop. Hi Dave. Hi Eric. This is Anthony. How you doing? Doing well. I loved um, the West Observer. I loved the show last night. But the well, call that guy in Maine, will you? That was on just before you. What was that? <laughs> Never mind. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, We're in low on time, so hurry up. Okay, I just want to make a quick point. When I heard that Eric Bishop was coming back to the show, I kind of liked it because he did bring it WCW to its highest point. But I don't like it. The fact that you might be there, Ric Flair. Is there still any animosity towards Ric Flair? And will you be getting rid of him as soon as possible, like you did last time? You know, I don't want to speak for Ric Flair, but uh, all, all I can tell you is Rick was very excited about what we did last night. Rick himself is very excited about what we've laid out to him for the future. I had a couple of drinks with Rick last night uh, after the show, and we had a great time. Well, that's so, true, but I mean, if you look at it, you have Scott Steiner telling everybody that he got rid of Austin, he got rid of Mick Foley, he got rid of the uh, the WCW. Four. You know, I don't I don't want to catch you up, but I know where you're going. And let me tell you that I agree with you on that. You know, that was wrong. You know, it's wrong to bring you know a lot of personal issues uh, to the television screen when when it's not designed to create. Uh, interest in, in, when it's not when it's not being done for money. If you're doing it, to, you know, to, to further a storyline or to build up for pay per view, and both parties are cooperating, then I think it's great, you know, to, to to play off reality. But when you're doing it just to vent, I think it was wrong. I thought I think it was wrong for Scott to do it. I told him I thought it was wrong, and it was a mistake. But um, the other thing is, is that you got Shane Douglas and Scott Steiner going after him, and it could. Uh, tilt the uh, fans' perception that Ric Flair did get rid of these guys, and that can, in a sense, bury Flair. And it's well, like, look, I understand that uh, that you, that, uh, you not that Hogan did have a big turnaround, but there's a lot of fans out there that do respect Ric Flair, and that's why he has this legend icon status. And me, as a longtime fan since '85, I'm always tell you, I don't want him there. All I can tell you is Rick was very excited about what he did last night. Rick was excited about what we laid out for him for the next couple of months. Uh, he's very comfortable with all of it, and he's glad he's a part of it. Now, if if you know if that doesn't speak for what Rick Flair wants and what Rick Flair thinks about what we're doing, then, then nothing does. And you know, people draw whatever conclusions they want to draw. Well, my last thing is: Are you going to bring the cruiserweight division back strong? Because as a lot of people have said that that was a contributing factor to Nitro being a good race juggernaut, the cruiserweight division, and uh, we don't want. The artist for me, you know, the put it case. You want Kobe and Ray bringing in 10 minutes, um, great match. Is that coming back? Yes. 
No, there's their answer. Eric, we've got to we've got to wrap up. We're uh, pretty much completely out of time here, Eric. I want to thank you very much for uh, doing the show. And uh, obviously, everybody wants to see WCW competitive. And I think even the people who uh, were taking you to task, so to speak, um, they're. I think everyone's goal is pretty much the same. They want to see a two horse race, and it's been a one horse race for a lot of months. Yeah, no, no, I agree. And listen, you know, I don't take the criticism personally. I really don't. Sometimes I make it sound like I do, but uh, I don't. You know, there are times when I need to be criticized. WCW needs to be criticized. We all need to be criticized, you know, for the right reasons at the right time.